Good morning, Naomi. Good morning. How are you doing, Naomi? Great. Anything going on in life? No, everything's good. Well, okay. That's a good thing. Time to pour me a little more coffee here. Keep the brain cells working. You been doing any painting? Hello, everybody. Hey, Armando. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Thank you. Let's see the other. I guess the rest there is still in the feathers. So, let's that, wait. That or they're getting their coffee or something. Uh-huh. <clears throat> you doing okay? Oh, yeah. And it looks like it's a beautiful day outside. It is a beautiful day outside. So. I'm out here actually sitting on the back porch. Mm -hmm. okay. Something that I notice is on you, you light the sun on you. Recording in progress. Well, if I don't have the sun on me, then I look like a, a dark silhouette. No, but I light the sun, but not on me and something that I observe in the sun. I have to do something because, uh, because I don't have much hair left and I feel like I might, the sun is cooking the top of my head. Okay. Well, with where I'm at right now, yeah, the, the sun is come, kind of coming through the trees. Mm -hmm. Five minutes from now, it'll all be kind of shaded. Oh, okay. Let's yeah. see. Oh, that's Veronica. Good morning, Veronica. Yes, there's Veronica. Good morning. Mm -hmm. so, My dog so, is barking, so I'm going to silence it for a second. Oh, well, okay. Your dog can bark. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, all right. If it's not bothering anybody. No. Nah, nah. Just teach your dog. When mama is in class, he has to remain quiet. Yeah. She'll get quiet in a minute. Yeah. Anyway. So, how are you doing, Veronica? Well, I'm waiting for a repair person. The hot water tank went out. Mm. So they got to change it. Okay. That's no but fun. Other, but other than that, I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. You're outside. Where are you? I'm on my back porch here in Smyrna. Oh, okay. I remember those times where the water heater used to, what was fixable. Today, nothing is fixable. They just change it, put something new. That's right. Right, yeah. Well, yeah, you used to be able to actually open up the water heater yeah. and replace the rods in it. Yeah, the, what you call it, the element? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a metal rod. And it's meant to, you know, basically deteriorate, you know, but it extends the life of the water heater, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but now, yeah, they're sealed and you can't do that anymore. No. Now it's, yep, cool new unit. No, no. 
a lot of things kind of gone that way. Yeah. But Mostly the, everything. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it doesn't require, <clears throat> it doesn't require as much skill to install a new water heater as it does to basically repair them and maintain yeah. them. And they do. They do the same with our cell or our body. Like me, the um, cardiologist says, well, the valve is, need to be replaced, and they replace it. And, mm -hmm. and the heart, and that is, but the heart's still pumping. Yep. That's good. Yep. You want to keep that thing pumping. Yeah. So, what did you, uh, did, did you see the thing yesterday that we watched at the end of class? on extending? I, I, I watch power and power and, you know, I still have for me to believe <laughs> you gonna you can do something about the aging. I don't know. You you do believe it or you don't believe it? No, I still don't believe it. That's the you don't believe it. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know. You know, they've, they've done an awful lot of research on it and they're actually, there are people who are actually showing, you know, really good results uh, from the, the therapy that they're giving them. Mm -hmm. um, and the way they're testing that is that they're looking at what they call the telomeres, which, which are the little kind of caps to the end mm -hmm. of your DNA. And by looking at those and how long they are, they can tell you basically, you know, within literally almost a year, you know, what, what stage or what age you're at, you know. Um, now, you know, you may, be, you may be 70 years old chronologically, but, you, you know, you could have, you know, telomeres that, that you know, genetically tell you that you're 55. Yeah. Or what about I, what about the body? Because the body get uh, worn out in parts. Well, that's your knees and your back. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you see, that's 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 what those telomeres are telling them, because you know, even though that's just the end of you know, like a DNA strand or your genes, that has an effect on how your your body is reacting, you know, whether or not you have a lot of inflammation or whether you have little or none. And, you know, biologically, the younger you are, the less of those problems you have. Yeah. So, so what they found is that with a change in lifestyle that you can actually reverse the aging process, like the, you know, the uh, researcher, the scientist who wrote that book, uh, mm -hmm. Sinclair, you know, when he tested, you know, himself at first, you know, he had telomeres that were telling him, even though that he was like only 50 years old. What is a telomere? Well, it's, it's that little end piece on your DNA. Oh, oh part of the DNA, okay. Right. So when he first tested himself, he, he tested at being like 65 years old, 15 years older than he was chronologically. Mm -hmm. And then after several years of following this particular routine, now his telomeres are telling him that he's only 31. Yeah. Because yes, I, I I would like to uh, improve my body a little bit, like I was before. Yeah. Know know my uh, mind and my uh, knowledge and wisdom that I had to the, uh, today. I wish I knew when I was forty when I what I know now. Right. But well, I would like to improve my my body a little bit, especially you know. Right. The joint, the knees. Right. Well, and, and what he's saying, and, and in fact, what they're showing, 
is that they can take people who, you know, are chronically aging, who have a lot of inflammation in their body and things like mm -hmm. that, and by putting them on a certain routine, that they can, in fact, reverse the aging process mm -hmm. and, you know, the knees, the back problems, the weight, you know, high blood pressure, you know, all of that stuff reverses. What is his name? Um, I think it's Nelson Sinclair. Is uh, David, David Sinclair. David Sinclair, okay. David Sinclair. Oh, David. David Sinclair, okay. But yeah, I mean, you know. Sinclair I've, with S or with C? S. Yes. yes, okay. Yeah. But I've, I've read a lot about him and, mm -hmm. you know, looked at a lot of the uh, studies out of Stanford on aging research. And it's interesting because it's uh, Stanford U, uh, University of San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco, uh, MIT, and Harvard. And all those four schools are doing research on this, you know, jointly right now. And uh, it's pretty fascinating with some of the stuff that they're really coming out with. I mean, it literally, it literally could change the way people live and how long they live and not just the length, but the quality of their life, you know, because they're not talking about letting you live to 120 or 150 and be suffering from joint pain and things like that. They're talking about living 120 good productive years where you're mobile and functional both physically and mentally and you know that that right at this point seems fairly possible you know from from what they're what they're showing right now and uh, uh what um uh, uh... What procedure he recommend they're going to do as a treatment or some exercise or some? Uh... Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lifestyle change. Lifestyle so change. Yes. So it's all of those. It's, you know, it's exercising uh -huh. uh, intensely for short periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cutting back the number of times you eat or limiting you know, the number of times you eat a day instead of eating all day long, you know, eating within a small window. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, like they recommend uh, whether, <clears throat> whether or not you have uh, diabetes or anything like that, uh, taking uh, metformin because metformin has been shown to have a positive effect, um, you know, in this process. You know, now I'm not... It's a, a good positive effect or bad positive effect? A good positive effect. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, but again, you know, you'd have to read his book or you'd have to do some research. And I'm, you know, personally, I would not be comfortable taking metformin, um, you know, unless you absolutely have to, because there are, well, my understanding is that there are actual side effects you know, to taking it, um, which I don't really want to deal with. But, mm. uh, you know, but it's, it's interesting stuff to look at, you know, because there's a lot of possibilities out there. They're finding out a lot about, you know, how we age and, um, and you know, possibly how to, you know, use that and turn it around and improve your health. So, you know. Neat stuff. Now, part, part of that was, uh, like he said at the beginning when he opened up, uh, even the medical profession sort of write off the elderly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get that. I get that all the time. It says, well, at your age, you got to start expecting that, you know, mm -hmm. that type of thing rather than uh, treatment <laughs> right? Or, 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 or advice on change of lifestyle. Right. It's just, well... You're at that age now, I think they're going to start <laughs> aching. Mm -hmm. Well, about changing lifestyle, all of you think about it. 
we all ch have been changing a lifetime. I am myself, I changed when I got 50. I changed a little bit when I got 60. The older that I was I'm getting, I was changing my lifestyle mm -hmm. in many ways and many things. Uh, for example, I used to be, uh, uh, I used to drink a lot. Mm -hmm. I used to be a party animal. I couldn't wait for Friday oh. to be out on the cloud. <laughs> and at some time, remember that, uh, uh, I, I stayed there until they turned the light on and said, hey, hey, we have to clean, you have to go. So, yeah. Well. And uh, all the things are. Um, yeah, I, used I don't to eat like a herb, and now I don't eat that much like I used to. All right. Yeah. Well, somehow I don't. I don't think that the uh, you know staying out till you know they sweep you out the door at six a.m. in the morning is is part of the lifestyle change they want you to make. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> but you know, it's, maybe it, because you were an angel when you were young. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know where everybody is, you know, and uh, we're going to get started. So, uh, you know, I want to I want to play a couple of videos by an artist um, by the name of uh, James Gurney. And you've seen him before. Uh, but he's got a couple of really interesting videos out. Um, one is about uh, this book that he wrote, Dinotopia. And we're going to kind of go through about mm, probably four or five videos, probably probably five, because uh, some of them are fairly short. But I'm going to start with this one because it kind of gives you an introduction into kind of who he is. And, and then we're going to get into some videos about, you know, the actual working process. Um, you know, what he actually has to do to you know, produce these books and these images uh, that he's creating, okay? And, you know, yes, they're about dinosaurs, but, uh, and, you know, you may not be interested in drawing or painting dinosaurs, but a lot of the processes that he's using um, would apply to you, you know, if you wanted to create a painting of an interior or something like that, that didn't really exist or, you know, something that you wanted to, um, you know, kind of make up, uh, you know, out of your own head. Um, but I think you'll find a lot of valuable stuff in here. So, uh, you know, have some coffee, sit back, and uh, kind of enjoy. These are kind of fun. So we're going to get started. The coffee is too early for margarita for the coffee. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I, I know you're you're doing the party animal thing, but you know, it's probably a little too early for margaritas. Okay. Well, now it's hot. It's a good time for the frozen margaritas. So. Yeah, maybe maybe later this afternoon. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So away we go. Dinotopia. Dinotopia. What's going on here? Big elevator. If I stood in the right spot and pressed the right button, I dreamed it would take me to another world. That world might be Atlantis or Shangri-La or Middle Earth or Ah. Okay, just for a second, just take a look around his studio. <laughs> I mean, come on. What a fun place, you know? Well, me, I'm almost a dinosaur already. Eventually, I found that elevator, but it brought me somewhere I didn't expect, a place called Dinotopia. Dinotopia is the one place on Earth where dinosaurs never went extinct. And humans and dinosaurs have formed a civilization together over thousands of years. This first came out as an illustrated book about 20 years ago, 
And in celebration of the 20th anniversary, I didn't do that. Did I? No. And what it's like to live among 10 ton dinosaurs. I never expected that I would become a fantasy author. I come from a long line of mechanical and. Okay. Bicycles. His father pioneered sound and technicolor for motion pictures. His father, my great grandfather, started a company that made ball bearings, the Gurney Ball Bearing Company. The one thing that they all had in common was that they were all curious, and they passed this down on to me. They all wanted to know how things were made, how they would look if you took them apart. And they all believed in drawing. Not that they were artists, they were engineers. They used drawing as a way to figure out how things were made, how to put things together, how to bring things into being. My father once told me, everything begins with a drawing. And if you can draw something, you can create it. Outside my bedroom door was a stack of old National Geographic magazines, dating back all the way to about 1910. When everyone thought I was asleep at night, I would tiptoe into the hallway and read these old magazines, learning about expeditions to South America, hoping to find some new evidence of a lost city. I would go sit in my front yard with my Tonka trucks, digging for my own lost cities, hoping to find dinosaurs or ancient Egyptian pharaohs. I never found anything, but this awoke a love, a fascination of archeology. span I ended up majoring in archeology span in college and then went on to art school. Later, I got a dream job working for National Geographic itself. My job as an archeological illustrator was to travel on location with archeologists and to try to reconstruct from the evidence in the ground what was the full picture of life in the ancient world. And at the end of each day of working with archeologists, we would often sit around the campfire and talk about the dream of discovering a lost city. And it was then that I got the idea that I could create my own lost world. This is where the whole idea began because the inspiration from this location caused me to paint Waterfall City. And that was the first painting of Dinotopia, a key location just like this, except imagine a huge city like Venice built in the heart of this waterfall. I came here as a college student and I have come here many times since to paint these falls, to paint the way the water comes over the edge. You can photograph it, but you have to come here to paint it to actually see what it looks like. And I use the colors and effects from making studies on location to do my paintings of Waterfall City and to transport myself in my imagination to this world beyond our own of Dinotopia. After completing Waterfall City, I got the idea of painting other panoramic scenes of lost empires. And the first idea that came to mind was a parade of people and dinosaurs. This painting grew out of the ideas that were emerging from science in the 1980s. The idea that dinosaurs were more like birds rather than like reptiles. This revolutionized everything. Uh, if I could imagine that dinosaurs were warm-blooded and intelligent and dynamic creatures, what would it be like to live with dinosaurs? So I began by traveling to museums, talking to scientists, going on location, I'm looking at dinosaur bones and footprints to try to visualize, to imagine what these creatures would look like. Often that meant doing studies of dinosaur skeletons in museums and to actually come in contact with the physical evidence of dinosaurs.
So I did a series of drawings based on this idea of people and dinosaurs living together. And then I drew a map. And by drawing a map, I pulled together all these separate lost world ideas into a single island filled with cities and jungles and canyons and mountains in the center. The mountains could contain the Ice Age mammals. So I invented a character named Arthur Dennison, a Victorian explorer who had a lot of skills as an artist and a scientist. And I set the story in 1860 because I wanted to choose a time when a lot of the world was still unexplored and it seemed possible that there might be a place like Dinotopia still existing. So if this were to be an adventure story, a travel story, I wanted to make sure it was long enough to really have enough scope to develop this world, all the dimensions of this world of Dinotopia, how people lived, how the dinosaurs and humans communicated, the sports that they may have had, uh, and some of the secrets that the island held of its distant past. In the second book, The World Beneath, we travel underneath the surface of the island to discover a huge network of caves and caverns where some ancient The next book in the Dinotopia series called First Flight is an origin story. And it's really about the origin of this whole civilization. I have the idea that the Dinotopia would have a period of struggle and sacrifice, an age of heroes where not everything was perfect and where the utopia that's now Dinotopia went through a dystopia and a troubled phase. The most recent Dinotopia book called Journey to Chandara takes us to the eastern part of the island, uh, the city of Chandara, an ancient civilization of its own. Uh, and here is where you find the feathered dinosaurs. In the time since I did the first book, the science of dinosaurs has changed considerably. And a lot of new types of dinosaurs, especially feathered dinosaurs, uh, have been discovered. And I wanted to include those in Dinotopia. And a lot of them are in the Chandara area. One of the challenges of creating the paintings for Dinotopia was how to paint realistic pictures of scenes that didn't exist. One of the things that I did was to start with a lot of sketches, loose sketches done in pencil or pen or marker to work out ideas just out of my, out of my imagination. I then did a storyboard to plan the entire book, 160 pages. Then for some of the major paintings, I went through a stage of doing a charcoal tonal study and a color study uh, before doing the final painting. A lot of the ideas for light and color and form in Dinotopia come directly from my plein air studies outdoors on location. I'm a very dedicated plein air painter and sketcher. And uh, by sketching real animals and birds, I get a lot of ideas for how dinosaurs would move and act and behave. And also, I traveled to places like the Grand Canyon to get ideas for how Canyon City should look. And places like uh, Toledo in Spain helped to inspire some of the cities in Dinotopia. Part of the process for getting realism was getting believable people. Sometimes that meant uh, putting on a costume myself, posing in a mirror, and doing a charcoal study for a final painting. Other times I would find the right costume and stand out in the driveway and then use the self timer on the camera to take reference photos. But if I needed a lot of different types of characters or kids or different people, I would have neighbors and friends come by the house and pose in the backyard. And we'd take uh, photos of a lot of different people in groupings and then use those photos as reference for doing the final paintings. When it comes to getting realism for dinosaurs or vehicles or architecture, I like to build three-dimensional maquettes or miniatures, reference models uh, to use uh, so that I can look at them from various angles 
and see how the lighting would work on those forms. So for example, uh, this is a maquette for a vehicle that's based on the design of an invertebrate creature that appears in the world beneath. Let me show you some examples of how these maquettes work. For this dinosaur, Bix, uh, who's a protoceratops, I built a poseable maquette out of oven hardening clay. And that allowed me to see how the light and shade would play on that form. For the top of a Brachiosaurus, I wanted to see how a saddle would fit over the top. And the way I did that was by building a maquette. For the skybacks, another key part of the story, I built a poseable maquette to use as reference to see how the skybacks rider would fit on the back of it. And for architecture, I used styrofoam and cardboard uh, held together with a glue gun. And that allows me to see how the light and shadow would play on, on those forms. Sometimes I set up a little tableau, a scene with dinosaurs and little figures in an architectural setting so that I can see how that whole scene would look on a given uh, sunny day. And then sometimes I take old plastic models and put them together in a different way uh, to make a reference maquette for a dinosaur vehicle. What I wanted to do with Dinotopia was to create a doorway where the reader's imagination could become engaged and where we could travel to that point of contact between art and science and imagination, between fact and fantasy. And I think that's ultimately what fantasy is all about. It brings us together, it takes us to other worlds, and in so doing, it brings us to a greater appreciation of the magic of the world around us now. So what'd you guys think of that? It was, it was interesting to see what he had to do to publish his, did a, he did a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah I, was, I was thinking the same thing, all that prep, prep, preparatory work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll well, look at those books differently now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things I was trying to impress upon you guys um, about, you know, creating really any kind of piece of art. You know, you don't see the preparation, you know, in doing a painting, you know, even, even a portrait or a landscape. Um, you know, just because you want to go out on location and do a plein air landscape, you know, as I was saying the other day, that that plein air painting, that's not the final thing oftentimes. It's just, it's kind of like you're going out there and you're doing your research. You know, you're, you're getting some kind of foundation and some kind of understanding of the place that you're, you're painting. And um, if, you, if you look at a lot of the uh, sketchbooks and journals and you know, writings of different artists um, all the way back, you know, into the Renaissance and, you know, the Hudson River School, you know, anybody who painted outdoors, uh, a lot of times they would go back to a place over and over and over again and, and you know, draw it, paint it, you know, on location, you know, in a small in a small format, something that they could easily accomplish within a fairly short period of time. And then they would go back to the studio and actually do the final painting. And that's, you know, a really common process, you know, with, with landscape painters and, and folks like that. Um, you know, they don't just start, a, you know, creating a landscape out of their imagination, uh, oftentimes. Um, you know, oftentimes they'll go out to an area of the country, you know, say 
out west to the Grand Canyon or something like that. And they'll do a whole series of paintings. And then they may come back, you know, much like Thomas Moran did and the Beard Stats. And they take kind of their collective experience of those paintings and then incorporate them into a final large scale, you know, painting. And that's exactly what, you know, Beardstadt and Moran did, you know, with the paintings that they took to Europe. You know, they weren't, they weren't photographic true representations of what they saw in the West. They were ideas and, you know, kind of composites of different locations put together, you know, to, to give people in Europe and also in the East, East at that time, who had never traveled West, an idea of what that was really like. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the creative process. Um, anybody got any, anything else to say about his work and what he's doing? No, I would like to be able to have the money to be a fortress like that, so I will feel I will feel uh, safe. For what's <laughs> going on around today? Oh yeah, yeah. Because so that would, that's a fortress, like a bullet bulletproof fortress. So I see. Okay. Yeah. Hey, there there are people out there doing that. You know, I mean, actually building you know stuff like that. Um. Not exactly, but, you know, um, a lot of people are out, you know, building their own, uh, own homes and things off the grid, you know, if so to speak. So, uh, you know, hey, look, uh, you know, one of the things he said was that if you can draw it, then you can create it. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's true with anything, you know. Um, it's like the work that I'm doing on my house right now. You know, before I launch into doing anything, you know, I do a series of drawings, and figure out the direction I want to head in and, you know, what, what that would look like when, you know, or what I hope it will look like when I'm done. Um, you know, I don't just start, you know, nailing up boards. Um, you know, there's a plan to it. And drawing is a part of that process, you know, figuring out, you know, what do you really want this to look like, right? So, you can learn a lot from that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on. We're gonna look at the next video. And uh, like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna see about five videos of his today. And this is uh, all about Tyrannosaurus and uh, some of the work he did you know, for some of the museums. All right. Hi, James Gurney here. I'm an illustrator for Scientific American Magazine. I just got a call from the art director to do a story on Tyrannosaurus, not T-Rex, the king of predatory dinosaurs, but some of his other cousins that aren't as well known. So let me show you a couple of the sketches I've been doing. I think it'd be fun to have a big U Tyrannus coming in from the upper left, and then have a couple of die longs down here, I'm trying to defend their kill from the big guy who's coming in to steal it. I do a variety of sketches in color, but the one that connects is this one showing the competition between two predators. And while I'm working on it, a red-shouldered hawk in my backyard is dismembering a mouse, but looking around for bigger hawks that might steal it from him. To gather references, I look in my old school image file, not only for photos, but for outdoor paintings that I've done of forests that would be similar to the ones in the Lower Cretaceous. I do a color sketch to work up the concept. 
And with that, approved by the paleontologist Stephen Bruce Sapp and the art director at Scientific American, I work up the drawing in pencil on illustration board. This will be the title spread in the magazine, so I need to make sure it fits the layout and has room for the type. Before I start the final oil painting, I need to seal the illustration board using acrylic matte medium mixed with some modeling paste to give texture. The oil paint goes on fairly thinly at first with a big bristle brush. Then I zero in on the face of the U Tyrannus. I gotta get him right when I start out because he's the engine of the whole story. I mix up some colors for the forest and paint it straight away, I'm going to finish effect immediately and covering the whole surface all at once. This kind of painting is called area by area painting or window shading. It's like putting down pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And it's only possible because I did an exact color study first and also was basing this on color sketches I did out in nature. Now at this point I'm starting to paint in the dinosaurs and I've got this little DeLong in there, um, but I'm not too sure I like him with his mouth open. I might want to paint his mouth closed. I often notice that there's a tendency to paint dinosaurs with their mouths open a lot. But if you look at real animals in the wild, they don't really open their mouth that much unless they're displaying or attacking. And if I was any one of those three little dinosaurs, I'd want to get out of there as fast as possible. I look at actual feet from turkeys and other specimens to get ideas for textures, like the feathers on this big dinosaur. And in the end, the painting's done after about a week of painting. Okay, now, here's the, here's the dramatic encounter. I bring the painting in to New York City to deliver it to Mike Mrak of Scientific American. And he comes up with the graphic design approach to make it work on the magazine page. There's a lot more to this behind the scenes story that I'd love to share with you. So I've made a 40 minute long full length uh, behind the scenes video. The full length video will include an expedition into the forest to record some plein air studies. We'll learn more about the dinosaurs and the various brushes that I used in the paintings. We'll also look at paints and priming materials and mediums. In addition to all that, the full length video will spotlight a second painting, which I did for the cover of the magazine. This is the Xianzhosaurus, discovered by the story's author, Stephen Broussat. And we'll start with the color sketches done in gouache and the comprehensives in casein, the pencil underdrawing, and then the underpainting before the final oil rendering. I'll talk about how to get realistic eyes and textures and the whole process of doing these two paintings from start to finish. Okay, you ready? Everywhere. Slowly. Faster. Tilting. Faster. Four seconds. Okay, I think we got it. Okay. Any thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. What? No, no, nothing. No? I thought it was. In, I thought it was interesting the way he did the overpainting on. Uh, of the draw pencil drawing and then mm -hmm. painted on top of that. Yeah, well, yeah, he, uh, like you said, you know, he did several, well, he did a lot of thumbnails. After he did the thumbnails, he did a, an actual black and white study. And then from the black and white study, he did a color study. And, and that's what he was actually working from, were those studies to do the final drawing and and you know again you know he did a, a pretty tight final drawing and then after that he sealed it so he could go back in and and work you know in on top of that um you know and he's got a good foundation he knows exactly where he's going by then and uh, you know so he's not really making a lot of changes at that point uh, you know because he's pretty much so got it you know Got it figured out.
And that's, that's kind of what you hope for, you know, by the time that you're doing a final painting is that you're not still trying to resolve issues, you know, at that point, it's, it's more just the process of, you know, playing with color and playing with the paint and the surface, and, you know, focusing on that stuff instead of having to solve big compositional issues or value issues or things like that. So it's uh is that, is that the same uh process or thinking that uh, say you use when you were doing commercial uh art yeah it's it's the exact same process and it's the exact same process that i keep you know pushing you guys toward as far as doing your paintings you know and instead of just jumping in on a big canvas and start laying color you know i mean Put some thought into it, you know, do a little bit of upfront work. Um, because honestly, I mean, you, you can do all that upfront work, you know, at a smaller scale, much faster, and resolve a lot of those issues so that by the time that you get to a big painting, you can actually do it in a, you know, in a reasonable amount of time because you're not having to backtrack and, you know, do corrections and make changes, you know, in the process of doing the final piece of art. That kind of makes sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yes, it does. All right. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I'm not trying to beat you guys up or anything, you know, but, you know, this is, this is an important, uh, you know, an important idea to get down and, and really begin to understand it because you notice when they opened both of these videos, what was he doing? He was sitting at the drawing board and he wasn't working on a big painting. He was doing thumbnails, right? You know, just doing little studies, you know, ideas, um, you know, that he could do quickly. And, you know, he was trying to work out, you know, his composition and values and things like that at that small scale so that when it got to the point of doing a big painting, you know, he was, you know, he knew where he was going and what he could do. So anyhow, all right. Any, anybody else got anything before we move on? Okay. All right. So let's, let's keep moving forward. Okay, uh, that's not the one we want. Let's see. They're wanting. Uh, well, let's kind of repeat. Let's do. Um, now, this is a. Hmm. Let's see. Yeah, there's other things I want to get to today. All right, so let's do. Yeah, this is a little bit repetitive, but you know, we'll do this one. And again, this is about, you know, and this is a little more in depth about how he actually paints, you know, a realistic looking dinosaur. Okay. Come on. Hi, my name is James Gurney. I'd like to take you behind the scenes to these paintings that I recently did for Ranger Rick magazine of dinosaurs to show you some tips on how to paint realistic dinosaurs using preliminary sketches, miniatures or maquettes for reference, bringing them outside into real lighting and then painting them in oil. Let's get started with this one here, which is a relative of T-Rex. The name of the dinosaur is Thanatotheristes, which means Reaper of Death. And it lived about 12 million years before T-Rex. What I'm doing here is a preliminary sketch. And this is really tip number one, is to do a small sketch 
first before launching into a larger finish. That lets you try out things like to try out this warm color in the background. So now as I do the final one, I can do a careful pencil drawing. And I know which way I'm going to be heading with the colors because I worked them out on that color sketch on the right. My second tip is to paint the dinosaur from an unusual angle. Try a lot of different angles, anything but just a straight side view or front view. This is kind of a three quarter view looking down from the eye level of the dinosaur. <clears throat> the light is coming from behind and I'm suggesting the textures of the feathery surface of this dinosaur by dragging paint with a palette knife. My third tip is to use photographs of birds from wildlife magazines for inspiration for color and for feathers. This is a ground hornbill from Africa. What's the secret for painting a complicated dinosaur like this, armored dinosaur called Borealopelta? The secret is to build a three-dimensional maquette or miniature to use as reference. Like last time, I did a preliminary sketch in watercolor and gouache to work out the basic lighting and angle. To figure out the pose of this walking nodosaur dinosaur, I draw a profile view in pencil with the near front and back legs extended outwards and the far legs underneath the pose. Then I cut out a side view of the dinosaur at the size I want to make this maquette. And using a wire, I can hold the angle of the spine and then cut pieces for the broad back of the dinosaur and the sides going down. Everything is held together with a hot glue gun. And then the width of the tail. Glue on his legs on the side. And now I have a framework to apply the modeling compound. I can't use an oven hardening compound because that would melt the glue. So I need to use an air dry sculpting material that I can apply to the surface of the cardboard base. The capture holes help to secure the material to the outside of the surface. The Model Magic sculpting material is really made for kids. It's quick to dry, inexpensive, and easy to use. The actual fossil, which comes from Canada, has beautiful detail in the spikes, the skin surface, and of course the bones inside. And for this maquette, I'm just going to start by sculpting the base without the spikes. And then I can add the spikes later after this is all dried and painted. I'll paint this using a light acrylic gray color. And then when that dries, I can apply the pointed spikes with a two-part epoxy modeling compound. Having these actual three-dimensional forms, even if they're fairly crudely sculpted, will give me a lot of information about highlights, shadows, and textural details that I'd have a real hard time making up if I was just working out of my imagination. Now holding the maquette in front of me, I can draw it in on the surface of a heavyweight illustration board using a graphite pencil. And then I can use acrylic paint in liquid form to block in the image before going to oil. I squeeze out a few blobs of the paint on a big enamel butcher tray and then using water I can thin it out as much as I need to. And I start out thinly enough that I can see the pencil drawing easily through the paint. And as I go along I can add opacity and figure out where the dark shadows will be. 
so that when I get to doing the oil paint, I have some idea of what I want the final piece to look like. I picture him coming out of the shadows a little hesitantly because a meat eater has just passed by. This painting of a baby dinosaur hatching out of its shell is based on an incredible discovery of a tiny dinosaur skeleton found inside an egg. I decide to make my maquette about the size of the actual fossil. The head is about the size of a grape. I've looped the wire around for the legs and I've used some tin foil for his chest area. This is polymer clay or Sculpey. And to really see how this guy would look inside his shell, I need to make an egg shell for this dinosaur egg. And I'm gonna use some plastic over a light bulb and then use two part sculpting compound, epoxy, putty, I have links in the description showing all these materials. Those eyes were too big, so I'm gonna use these little plastic beads for eyes instead, which are probably more accurate to the size that they would have been. If the way dinosaurs hatch is anything like birds, they would have pushed the egg apart with their back muscles after splitting the egg open using the sharp egg tooth on the front of its nose. I give the maquette a few light washes of acrylic to give it some color. Some dinosaur eggs were pigmented on the outside, so I made this one greenish. I could take it outside in actual sunlight. It was really helpful to know how the light and shadow played on those forms, how they overlapped, and how it all fit with the moss. To get those textures of moss, I'm using acrylic paste and matte medium. By putting that on with a rough house painter's brush, I can get all kinds of interesting textures that I can paint on once I get to oil. I go into this pre-texturing step a little more in my Gumroad videos of painting dinosaurs, which you can find linked in the description below. I wanna focus on dull reds, dull yellows, and green, and I'll be using acrylic before going to oil. This stage though, I'm still using acrylic to do the first stages of the painting, and starting with the eye. I often start with the eye to get that right at the beginning, the rest of the picture sort of follows naturally. But now I'm getting into the textures of the moss. A lot of birds use moss for nest building, often alternating it with sticks. I'm using oil paint now and I'm painting the spaces between the tendrils of moss. Then I can paint the shadows cast by the little dinosaur on the inside surface of the shell. But I realize the eggs are a little bit too oval and pointed. Eggs come in all shapes and sizes, but sauropod eggs, uh, the kind of dinosaur this is, the long neck dinosaurs, have rounder eggs. So if I shave some off the end and add some to the middles, I can make them rounder instead of so oblong. Mm. 
that baby dinosaur has a lot of growing to do, and it might end up looking like these giant long-necked dinosaurs called Patagotitan from South America. I make a small maquette out of two-part epoxy and try to match it up with the scientist drawing of the skeleton. And what I'm going to want to do is take this outside into actual sunlight because the neat thing about a scale model is that the sunlight will scale up on it perfectly. I think of this stage a lot like a chalkboard. I erase a lot, redraw it, erase it, redraw it until I get the placement where I want it. Then when it's ready, I can seal it with matte medium, Put in the modeling paste for texture. And then I'm ready to start laying it in with oil paint, getting those that dark, stormy looking sky. And if I need to reposition something like this leg, I can do that at this stage. Maybe I can have a cast shadow across this near dinosaur. And then a dark pool in the foreground as they come for a drink into the open space. Play elephants would or giraffes in Africa. We don't really know much yet about what colors these sauropods might have been, but I'm imagining them having a sort of a spotted pattern, a little bit like a giraffe. Look at studies there in the lower left uh, that I did of ferns, tree ferns, cycads, monkey puzzle trees to use as inspiration for the foliage. I'll put some shadows cast by these dinosaurs along the bank of this pond, and maybe some palmettos in the foreground. Beyond those plants is a dark pool in shadow which acts as a mirror for the dinosaurs beyond. And here's the final painting. Finally, here's Spinosaurus at the water's edge, going into the shallows to pick up a fish for dinner. I painted this by building a maquette, but also building the environment that it goes into.
and I want to make the maquette literally standing in water by setting up a sloping beach on a piece of wood with surfacing compound. Painting them and then filling the bowl here, this plastic bowl with water that has some paint in it to make it a little bit lighter. Because I want the water to be lighter. He's casting a shadow. And as I paint him in, I can start thinking about the shadows and reflections in the water, which I can see from that maquette in the lower left. Now the very top edge of the painting can be reflections from the far shore. I'm going to try an experiment here. I've placed some random colors along the top edge of the picture. I'm going to drag this piece of cardboard down. The goal is to create some reflections that I can pull down into the painting to look like reflections in water at a distance. I think it'd be cool to have a pattern like this on the tail itself. The big sail back, and it has sharp, almost crocodile-like teeth. It would have been great for grabbing fish out of the water. And the final painting is an attempt to show an animal that's at home in this environment and part of it. Scientists keep discovering new pages from the book of the past, new types of dinosaurs, new theories on how to interpret them. So you can use these tips to paint dinosaurs realistically. Here's a video that has more about that and a playlist with more about painting dinosaurs. Don't forget to visit my website and to subscribe to my channel. Whether it's morning. Okay. So you guys had enough of dinosaurs for a while? It's amazing how he makes those little models and there's just mm -hmm. and, and the accuracy of his models. <laughs> yeah, there it's it's a fairly intensive process. Um but it's kind of an important one, you know, because in the process of doing that, you know, he, he resolves a lot of the issues. Sorry, I've got a jet fighter flying over here right now. All right. Anyway, he resolves a lot of the issues, you know, like value and, and lighting, um, you know, and by, by sort of roughly coloring them, you know, he also gets a lot of information about how the how the light reacts, you know, on different color surfaces and, and how it changes, you know, because of the light. So, you know, it's um it takes time to do a lot of that stuff, but in the long run it saves you a lot of time uh, in the process of doing it because you don't you don't have to figure out quite so much. You can actually visually see it and and it makes it easier to paint would you think any of you would actually you know if if you had to do a, a painting that you had to cr kind of create things for do you think you might consider trying something like that no <laughs> 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 really? 
brutal honesty. It's like, yeah, no. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you. But no, thank you. I don't want to work that. Right. Out. Okay. All right. All right. But I did, I did uh, want to kind of, he did not use a camera on anything when he did his modeling and uh, put them out in the sun for shadows and things like that. He did not take pictures. He just actually did the, the uh, uh, sketches, the drawings. Well, no, the fact is he did actually, when he was outdoors, he did actually take photographs from different angles. Oh, he did? I, I missed that. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, well, right there on his, next to his drawing board was like a, a printed out photo of the Spinosaurus going into the water mm. that he had photographed, you know, with the cast shadows and things on it so he could actually look at it, you know, and see what the, the light and the shadows were doing. So... So no, he uses photography as well. Um, I, I missed that point. Yeah. So we're gonna, I'd rather paint Totankas than a dinosaur. Dinosaur. You'd rather paint what? Totanka. What? That is an Indian word, and you told oh, me you're Native Buffalo. American. Oh, you mean, uh -huh. you mean Totanka. Yes. Yeah, and well, it's only, it's actually a Sioux word okay uh -huh. yeah yeah it did, it, the cherokee don't use the same word for buffalo or bison okay mm -hmm. yeah they're different languages <laughs> okay but our, our, our Mon armando you could make a model of a a figure or of a chair or, or uh -huh. of your couch if you wanted right. to yes yes he could he could make a model you know of a woman you know, lying on his couch. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, he could, you know, and then light it and photograph it any way he wants to. So, no. And if he made her opposable, then he could use her multiple times in different poses. So, there you go. <laughs> there you go. See? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, what can we say? Anyway. <laughs> At any rate, uh, okay, so now we're gonna get away from painting dinosaurs. Same guy though, okay? And he's gonna talk a little bit about his process of doing like people and portraits and things like that, which you might find, you know, a little more applicable to something that you wanna do. But again, you know, the working process is not all that much different, okay? So. So let's see, uh, yeah, we're not gonna do that one. Well, here, he's painting a landscape in this one, but he's only using two colors. So let's do this one. Let's find a way. Okay, we gotta get past the shoe ad. Another day of the super. Okay. I don't know what's quite happening here, but it's kind of like skipping forward. Let's back up. see if we can start over again. Another day at the supermarket. There's got to be. Not stop. All right. Try one more time. Another. There's got to be something to paint in this parking lot. Okay, I'll see you in 45 minutes. So it's 27 degrees outside, a little cold for painting in water media. But as long as I'm inside the car here, I should be able to just work through the windshield. And I've got my stuff here set up in my lap, a watercolor sketchbook. And it's primed with uh, grayish watercolor just to knock down the white.
They say that ice is made of just oxygen and hydrogen, two elements. So to paint it, whoa, I'm gonna use two colors, just blue and burnt sienna. Let's see what happens. So I've got the white gouache, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, and I might use that alizarin crimson later for the car that's parked. This is a small palette area, only about two and a half inches by four and a half inches, so there's not much room to move here. Now I'll start out with a cool shadow color. I'm not using white yet because I want the variations in the tone. I want it to settle in unevenly into that shadow color. It's fairly dark, it's a little bit cool. But I want it to be kind of grainy because that's the way that snow looks. And if I introduce just a touch of white, it becomes a slightly smoother color of blue without that graininess. So that's what you can do with gouache, is control the texture or the graininess by using a little bit of white. Now I also have this building in the distance. It's a rectangular shape behind uh, the snow pile there. I'm using a brush in a stipply way, hitting the surface with the tip of the flat brush to get that texture of the concrete. Now I want that flat tone again, so I'm bringing in some more gouache for the sky. It's kind of a milky textured paint. There's a car that's parked next to the snow pile. I need to draw in the car and I'm gonna do it with these blue lines in the chrome that's reflecting the sky behind us. And next I wanna have a quarter inch long flat to paint in the shapes of the darks of that car. This way of painting, I sometimes call painting with spots and dots, because really what you're doing is you're placing small or large shapes or dots in position, not worrying so much about line, like you would if you were drawing with a pencil, but more an impressionistic approach uh, that places light and dark shapes next to each other. The nice thing about a long, flat, quarter-inch brush like this is you can paint all sorts of shapes, like that radiator grill shape or the mirror shape or the shapes that are behind the car. So I'm just putting in some spots and dots and dashes and flashes back there building it up out of rectangles, like almost out of Legos. Now that car is anchored to the ground and the snow in front of it by a fairly deep cast shadow. I'll mix that with ultramarine and burnt sienna and lose that whole edge of the bottom of the car. More spots in the background. As I look at the snow pile, the shadow side is cool, but there's a warm edge where the light is scattering under the surface of the ice and coming out on the shadow side. Mm -hmm. So I wanna keep that effect of that warm glowing light by keeping some of that underpainting color showing through. If I spend too long looking at the shadow side, I can forget that the lightest value in the shadow is nowhere near as bright as those illuminated areas in the sunlight. So let's wet that whole shadow side with water. And while it's wet, I can drop in a few little dark accents. 
or some of the hollows of the snow, just to accentuate that textural character without going too light and dark in that shadow. I just touch it with the edge of the brush, the corner of the brush. Those little blobs of color should spread out a little bit. Now you might wonder, why just use two colors when you have a whole palette full of colors that you could use and make it more rich and vibrant in color? Well, there's an argument to be made for speed, efficiency, and economy. I've only got a small amount of space, a small amount of time, and I don't want to waste a whole lot of colors. But more than that, I want to explore the range of possibilities of each of these pigments. You really learn about each pigment when you just do one against another like this. And it's kind of like composing for a piano and violin. You explore what those two instruments can do together. The only other color I've added is lizard and crimson. I brought that back in because I used a touch. All right, come on. Let's try that again. You explore what those two instruments can do together. The color I've added is lizard and crimson. I brought that back in because I used a touch of that on the car get that reddish color. These strokes are a little too light. They'll dry darker. A gouache sometimes shifts when it dries. There's a lot you can do with just color temperature, meaning how orangey it is or how bluish it is. For those of you not too familiar with color, Sometimes this relationship is called complementary. If the two colors, if you mix them together and you get gray, then the colors are seen as complementary. Um, not only blue and brown or reddish brown, uh, but also violet and yellow or red and green can be used in complementary relationships. When mixing a color, my first thought is about the value. Is it light or is it dark? Then my second thought is usually, is it cool or is it warm? This limited palette keeps me in that dialogue of just warm versus cool and value without really even thinking too much about hue. That would probably be the third thing I'd think about after thinking about value and color temperature. I think about the hue where it is on the color wheel, yellow, red, green, or whatever. And then the final thing you think about when you're mixing colors is saturation. Whenever you paint toward the light, you're dealing with less overall chroma or saturation or brightness of the colors. The colors are grayer than they would be if you're painting away from the light. In fact, if I switch the camera around in the opposite direction, you can see how colorful all the cars and trees and the sky are. But in this direction, everything organizes mainly according to value with lighter things farther back. And anything that's in shadow is a fairly deep shadow. So ultramarine blue and burnt sienna are completely adequate for painting a subject like this since I don't need to get into brighter colors. If I did need to, if I was painting away from the light, then I could use uh, more full chroma colors. All these branches lend themselves pretty well to painting with a dry brush effect because I just want the texture of the branches. I can't paint every single individual branch. So by splaying out the tip of the brush and then spreading it out with somewhat dry paint on the, on the fibers, I can get that texture that sort of simulates the look of the branches against the sky. This is part of the fun of painting for me is trying to look at nature and all its complexity and variety <laughs> and trying to think how I can translate what I'm seeing into something that brush can actually accomplish, whether it's dry or wet or just a whisper of pigment on the brush or loaded with juicy pigment. 
the character of the branches and the leaves here, the character here is blobbier, evergreen foliage. So I have a wetter brush and I'm moving it kind of randomly. I try to let my hand and fingers have their own mind. I was reading that an octopus has a brain at the base of each tentacle and every tentacle has its own personality. And that's kind of what your fingers have to have is, yeah, they have to have a mind of their own. You see there's a cast shadow of the, of the whole snow pile on that dark asphalt. That explains that dark edge in the lower left. Now I want to mix a warm color, fairly high in value, to lighten the darks on the curb adjacent to that wet driveway that leads back to the train tracks on the right. Well, Jeanette's doing shopping for the holiday feast, so naturally she's taking a little longer than 45 minutes, and that gives me enough time to finish up some final details. It was fun just contemplating this complicated scene, doing a speed painting from a parked car. I can always use the colored pencils at the end, hit them with a little water to soften them up and they'll blend into the painting. I guess time's up. I need an unloader, please. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a full-length instructional video that took this material on complementary colors and ran with it? And there is. And he did it. Okay. And white and complementary colors. Mm. And we're going to take that. All right. So. All right. So any thoughts about that? It was a it was a process, that's for sure. Mm hmm Yeah, but And he, you have to have practice patience as you're doing it. Yes. Um takes, okay. takes plain air to another level. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In your car. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, well the fact is, okay, and, and here's what I was gonna say to you, you know, notice how small he was working and that on like those unbearably like rainy hot summer days that are like really humid, you can sit in your car and you can paint with the air conditioner on and look out, you know, your, your window, you know, and paint things. Uh, you don't have to necessarily be out in the middle of all the bugs and stuff like that. And there's a lot of plain air painters who do that, you know, and particularly like in bad weather, uh, when they're trying to get scenes like winter scenes and things like that. Like you said, it was 27 degrees outside. He didn't want to stand out there and and freeze while he was actually painting that, you know. Plus, the water would have frozen, you know, in the paint, which would have made yeah. it more difficult. But, uh, you know, there's always ways of getting around stuff, you know. So, hi, Rebecca. How are you doing? I just got back from the dentist. Not so well. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you know, I actually, uh, we're, we're looking at a guy by the name of, of uh, James Gurney, and he did uh, a, a video on his book, Dinotopia. Oh, I've got that book. It's a wonderful right. book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's got five of them out now. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, he was talking about his process, which, you know, I think would have been helpful to you in particular. 
Um, go back and watch him. Thank you. Yeah, but yeah, go back and look it up on uh, YouTube okay. and, uh, and watch it. Uh, okay. Because, yeah, he talks about, you know, the steps he went through in putting that book together. And um, very interesting. Thank and you. How he developed all the images and stuff for it. So, at any rate. Um, okay, how are we doing time wise? We got a little bit of time. Um, I'm going to do a, you know, the last video I'm going to do with him is on him painting portraits. And, um, you know, again, I think this is probably a good thing for you guys to take a look at. And uh, just kind of watch kind of how he, you know, very kind of methodically, um, you know, goes through the process. So, and uh, he's using uh, what, what they refer to as a Zorn palette. So it's a, a limited Stream 85. Uh, color palette again. With YouTube TV. Try it free. This is what you're doing. Okay. Let's actually get to the video, please. Okay. But now let's try. Okay. So what I'm do is do this portrait for you in the one. Yeah. For some but reason it's loading try, slowly. But now let's try introducing black and white. Ah. This is not funny. <laughs> Yeah, it's just. But now let's try introducing black and white, some other warm, dull oranges on the color wheel. So what I'm gonna do is do this portrait for you in the wild while I pull a nail out of my tire. Great, and just say, say your name and what the oh, business. I'm Clayton Van Cleek, and my parents, Bob and Janet Van Cleek, started the business. So. So this is the tire place near us. We come here often to get a tire rotation or to put our snows on. This time we got to get a puncture fixed. So we're sitting in the waiting room. And I think I'll just paint this workstation. Now I don't need a whole lot of colors to paint this. Out of all the colors available, all I really need are bright red, yellow ochre, which is a dull yellow, and ivory black. This is sometimes called the Zorn palette after the Swedish painter Anders Zorn. Now I can add any colors as long as they fit into the shape of that color scheme. It's also called the gamut. Here's the set of colors I'll be using. The paper itself will be primed first with casein, raw sienna and white mixed together to make kind of a dull yellow. Then I have gouache, white, yellow ochre, light red, which is an iron red, ivory black, and pyrrole red, a good accent red, you could use cadmium too. And for that iron ferrous red, you could use a watercolor like terra rosa. So it's a simple color scheme that we used to see on the old magazine covers. And this was done just for economy's sake to print with limited color. If you look at the original Lion Decker painting, it actually has some browns in it, not just black, white, and red. Now here's how the page looks when I start. And I had uh, done the underpainting or priming back in the studio. So it's dry as I begin. I started by drawing the lines of the base of the counter, the column, putting in the computer quickly, and here the business cards and the white just important blocky shapes to orient myself. There's a lot of detail behind the computer, but I'm gonna to have to simplify that. Painting a big white area around the computer itself. And I can make a gradation to kind of surround that like a glow. 
and just do away with all that detail back there for now because it doesn't really matter what's back there. I can cover that underpainting with semi-opaque layers that gradate and they gradate in wash here only if I mix wet areas together while they're still wet. Otherwise, it'll be very dry brushy. I was kind of hoping to paint Greg at his workstation, but he's been away somewhere. So I'll just paint the workstation itself. And if he comes back, I'll put him in. In real life, this is a pretty gray scene. But as far as the accent colors go, the red accents, the ones that matter to me are the red pens in the coffee cup and the red dot on those business cards. Now, I may have been a little hasty to do the computer first because I gotta suggest the objects that are just beyond the computer on the countertop. And also there's a whole section of the room on the right hand side back there. And the only way I can really show that is by looking up here at the ceiling so we can see the lights on the ceiling. They'll get thicker and bigger, these lines, as they get higher, as they would be in perspective. And the thickest one at the top, this one, oh, I went too far over that divider. I can always come back and fix that. I don't know what this is, really just some nifty dots to partly fill a space. We don't have to be too exact here. Oh, cool, here's the man himself. My name is Greg, I work at Van Cleek's Tire. A lot of these things came out of tractor tires, farm tractors. Some came out of regular passenger car tires. But there's probably, I'd say about 100 pounds of steel here. Hmm. They drive in with that, I mean this stuff, some of them are loose. Some of the tires come in loose out of farm tractors. And most of this stuff all down here below came out of passenger car tires. I'll turn it around so you can see it. Did you ever have like a bullet or any, what is any really weird things? There's about? a bullet. Actually, there was a live round in one. It's still alive. Mm -hmm. um, it inside of the tire. We had to take out. Yeah. And what's involved in doing that, taking that out? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you say a word about like how you create uh, an atmosphere for your workers here? Because I noticed there's a really great feeling in the place? Uh, that's just because I want to. And it's, it's about uh, helping everybody do the best. I'm a tough guy to work for, I think, at times, because yeah. I, I expect a lot. But it's all about customer service. I ask our employees to advocate for the customer. Don't worry about the business. We'll all set pricing and we'll do stuff, but advocate for the customer. So yeah. they all know that, that they are, are supposed to be making sure you get what you want. And I know my years of experience, if we take care of you, example, that you're going to come back. Yeah. So I like LL Bean. I like philosophies like that. So we're the LL Bean entire business. Clayton and Greg seem relaxed because they know what they're doing. They've done it a lot of times. Their workstations are organized. And when he comes back to his station, I say, "Don't pose, but I'll just paint you while you're working." His hand goes from his mouse his keyboard, he has his calculator, his telephone, and his computer, that's about all he needs. Big gray shape for his work shirt over a guide drawing in graphite pencil and white pencil drawn straight over the dry gouache. And there's a light just above his left shoulder, and that makes his gray work shirt look like a light gray work shirt, at least on those planes that zigzag down his right arm. Now here's a little trick. Uh, in order to get back to that underpainting color, I can use a slightly dampened paint rag and lift off the area for his face and for his hands. And that way I don't need to paint in opaquely. And now over that underpainting, I'm painting in the planes of the face. Eyes, nose, mouth, find the chin. 
Now you might wonder, why not use the pencil at this stage to <clears throat> sketch in the face? That's the most important part, isn't it? <coughs> well, a pencil will give you lines, but a brush will give you shapes or planes in three dimensions. And I find it easier sometimes to paint a face in terms of planes. Another basic question is why not take a photo and bring it home and paint it from the photo? Sitting here gives me three advantages over taking a photo, bringing it home and working from the photo. First of all, I'm a fly on the wall for the activity of the office. I see how Greg uses his workstation, how he moves around in it. I learn what all the things do. And visually, I only focus on the things that are important to the story. Having the dark paint on the tip of this brush lets me paint in a few accents, a few creases and lines. So Greg and his team out in the shop fixed our puncture, our car's ready, and we made a friend and did a painting. That's cool. That's so this idea of a very limited palette that uses black, white, and the color is a great tool for self-teaching. And my approach to self-teaching has been to break down complicated problems into manageable exercises that I can accomplish and then take them in the field. That's what I'm going to be doing with this series of videos on color and practice. We're going to go through in the first video and look into black and white and complementary colors and we're going to take them from simple exercises that you can do yourself to actual demonstrations in the field. I think this will be a valuable approach because you can explore the dimensions of it in a safe environment before you actually try to apply them in a painting. So join me for Color in Practice. Ta -da. So what's your thoughts about you that? Watch another video. He, he's fast and he's accurate and he's good. <laughs> yes, he's had lots of practice at it. I mean, yeah. he's, he's been working as an illustrator and generally a painter for probably well over 30 years. You know, and so uh, I think- Yeah, it shows that was excellent and- yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would get maybe one-tenth of that done. He was just zip, zip, zip. Well, you might be actually surprised, actually, how fast you can move. You know, um, like when you did the painting of your backyard, you know, and, and the flowers and things, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's not something that you normally do. And so the first couple of times you do it, it feels a little awkward and along the way you begin to figure out a few things to make it a little more efficient right right and and so it's like anything else it's practice and you you know you practice that particular approach or that particular skill until you know you get good at it you know just like with drawing right so you know it's it's uh okay you know it's all kind of the same thing you know, it's, uh, you got to practice and you got to try some things and, you know, maybe you, you uh, mess up a couple of times, you know, but when you're making those mistakes, you know, you're also, you know, figuring out, you know, what not to do or maybe ways of doing it better. So. You know. I, I liked what he said about <clears throat> The difference between using the pencils for lines and the brushes for shapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's <clears throat> you know there there's the big difference between painting something and drawing something is that usually with a pencil you are you're making a, a line you know you're looking at a boundary where something begins and something ends you know in painting you're looking at either light or dark and a shape and how the shapes fit together. So it's a, it's a slightly different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, for me, it's easier to paint something sometimes than it is to draw it. Yeah. Well, yeah, because otherwise you'd be doing a whole lot of lines if you want to do a big block of, of yeah. big block of shape. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can sit with a big brush and block in a big shadow in a painting in a matter of seconds. And if I'm trying to do that in the drawing, it may take me, you know, depending on the size of the drawing, it might take me a half hour, 45 minutes. Right. So, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a real different process. So. Anyhow, <clears throat> anybody got any thoughts about, uh, you know, James Gurney or painting or anything that we, we kind of looked at today? No? I, I, I do have a question about, was it Zorn, Z-O-R-N, mm -hmm. Andrew Zorn? Yeah, Andres, yeah, Zorn. I, yeah, and he was famous for making that particular palette because mm -hmm. that's what he painted in all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, he and Sargent, a lot of the uh, a lot of the painters in the mid eighteen hundreds used what they call a limited palette. Right. Okay. And um, you know that goes back to that idea that really all you need is is the primary colors red, yellow, and blue, and white, and with with just those four colors you can make almost anything. Yeah. And the big mistake that a lot of beginning artists make is they have too much color out on their palette and too many choices, um, which just makes it confusing. And because you've got all that variety of color, it's hard to create what we call color harmony. You know, there are colors, uh, you know, that can directly conflict with each other. Um, so, you know, sometimes using a limited palette and trying to make those colors, you know, out of the basic colors that you have, you know, make a much stronger painting in the end. So that, I, I uh, can identify with that, Charles. I was painting the picture of, of, of coleus plants in my backyard that are in pots. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have purple. I had to make it from the primary colors. Right. And that, that was hard, but it was a lot of fun. First I experimented and it came out black and brown. And then I realized I had to add more red to the blue and whatever. Yeah, until so, you got the right color balance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's all learning how to mix color. Right. You know, and... You know, my, when I begin to teach people painting, you know, I want to limit them to the primary and secondary colors only. Right. That's it. You know, you don't need all the earth tones. You don't need a lot of these other, you know, accent colors and things like that. You really just need those primary and secondaries. And if you have that, you know, you can make almost anything. Now, you know, if, if you had, say, a couple of different reds, uh, you know, one that was warm and one that was cool, and a yellow that was, say, warmer or cooler, and a blue that was, you know, if you can believe this, warmer or cooler, you know, then you would be able to expand that range and get more intensity out of things like oranges and things like that. But... You know, again, that's, that's like another step in the process. Right. You know, if you can make any kind of orange whatsoever, it's fine. It will work. Yeah. It may not be as bright as you want it to be, you know, by mixing it with just with the primaries. But, uh, you know, still, you know, you, you can get there. Or a purple. You may not be able to get as clean and bright as of a, a purple as you really want. But you can still get a violet. So, okay. Uh, I have a question. Okay. It's different. What is the location tomorrow? The location tomorrow is Heritage Park in Sandy Springs. Heritage Park in Sandy Springs. Yes, I'm going to send out. I'm familiar with that part, but I will find it. Yeah, it's right there by the Kroger. 
on Sandy Springs Circle. By the Kroger, oh. It must be, oh, you mean the one in from the city hall? Or no. the little one where it used to be the, the, the Mason Lodge? No. No, it's, it's, uh, it's on Sandy Spring Circle. It's an old historic house. It's where the spring oh, you for Sandy Springs was named. House. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah oh, it's right. So yeah, the park, the park is right behind it. Yeah. And you can either park on the side street or you can park in the parking lot back behind it. Yeah, I'm familiar with that area. And or there's a small drive off the side street that mm -hmm. goes down to the bottom. Yeah, okay. And if it has very few parking spaces. Yeah, all right. And, uh, and uh, but you can, you know, you can bring your stuff down there and drop it off and then go back up and park along the street. Because I want to keep that open because there's a couple people coming who can't walk very far. You know, like Jean, you know, she needs to be dropped off. And there needs to be enough room, you know, for people to drop them off. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to turn around and get out of there. Because it's kind of tight. So, okay. Yeah. All right. So it's on the uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Heritage something. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's called Heritage Park. Um, it's anyway, I'm, I'm going to send out an email and it will have a map. So just, go well, there. okay. Thank okay. you. That's the plan. All right. Anybody else? They do have a restroom. Yes, they do. In, inside that, inside that old building. Yeah. Inside the museum. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now the thing is you have to, uh, well, you hope that the museum is open tomorrow. <laughs> right. And that there's somebody there but if yeah. not if not the uh, building that's right up the hill you know uh where the amphitheater is that's yeah. usually open and they have bathrooms in there that you right. can use and worst case scenario you could walk all the way over to kroger, right. yeah. Yeah. Like kroger. yeah so yeah. so there are restrooms nearby they have a big gazebo there in case it rains everybody can get under that also, you can walk to the Irish pub. <laughs> yes, you, yes. It's yes, Irish Armando, pub right yes, Armando can walk to the Irish pub. Um, actually, the Irish pub has really, really good lunch. Yeah, uh, shepherd pie. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, their food, their food is, their food is good. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's uh, that's Armando's watering hole, the Irish pub. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in there a few times. It's, it's really very nice. Um, and there's also some restaurants, yes. you know, it, very April, close to the Irish pub. Later on April. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Jay Christopher. Yeah. But yeah, there's, there's plenty of places to eat. And um, tomorrow being, well, tomorrow's Thursday. Yeah. I was going to say, um, Usually, well, it could be Thursday at Kroger. Well, like one day of the week, they have a, a special on sushi, if you like sushi. And mm -hmm. they, they make their sushi right there fresh every day. So uh, Yeah, they do. Yeah. We would run over and, and get sushi and sit, you know, in, inside Kroger and eat lunch uh, oftentimes. So it's inexpensive. It's good. It's fast, you know. So, so for those of you inclined, you know, to do that. So, all right. Anyhow, uh, that's all I got. All right. We're going to see you else? tomorrow at 10. Yes. Yeah. Yep. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, okay. We Bye, will everyone. see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.